In this slideshow, I start by discussing the demands and capacities model of stammering, which proposes that stammering occurs when the demands placed upon a person to communicate exceed their capacity to fulfill those demands. I then outline some stammering statistics, including the age when stammering symptoms most often appear, its prevalence in the population, and the factors that are known to influence whether or not it will develop into a disorder and persist. I then discuss evidence which clarifies the extent to which stammering is likely to be genetically inherited, and I discuss some of the environmental factors which may play important roles in its onset. And then finally, I discuss how a vicious circle may develop, whereby stammering may become self-sustaining even after the factors that first caused it to develop are no longer present. With regard to the causes of stammering, perhaps the first thing that needs to be said is that although it's evident that there are many things that predispose people to stammering, researchers have not been able to identify any one single cause or factor that's always present before a person starts to stammer. Nevertheless, it's widely believed that people who stammer have some or other underlying weaknesses that limit their ability to reliably produce speech that's appropriate and well-formed enough for some of the more demanding speaking situations that they encounter in their everyday lives. In this regard, stammering is sometimes described as a capacities and demands issue, inasmuch as it appears to occur when the demands of the speaking situation appear to exceed the speaker's capacity to fulfil them. For example, most stammerers have no difficulty speaking to themselves without stammering when they believe that no one's listening, and most have relatively little difficulty speaking fluently in situations where they really don't care how their speech sounds. But in situations where they perceive a need to speak well, and in situations where the subject matter is, in, is complicated and they don't want to make any mistakes, they're far more likely to stammer. So essentially, we're most likely to stammer when there's a gap between our capacity and what we perceive are the demands of the speaking situation. When we talk about the causes of stammering, really, we're talking about the things that cause this gap. And in most individuals who stammer, there are likely to be several factors that coincide or come together to cause it. In the slides that follow, I want to discuss what some of these factors are and how they may interact with each other to cause stammering. I'll start by discussing the predisposing factors or risk factors that are known to be associated with an increased risk of developing a persistent stammer. All of these risk factors are clearly presented in this chart, which I've copied and pasted from the website of the Stuttering Foundation of America. In it, the factors are listed in order of importance, with the most important one having a family history of stammering at the top. These risk factors are cumulative, which means that the more boxes a child ticks, the more they'll be predisposed to developing a persistent stammer. It's a useful exercise to remember back to your own early childhood and see how many of these boxes you would have ticked. Do bear in mind, however, that it's quite possible to be subject to all of these risk factors and yet never to actually develop a persistent stammer. Many children, indeed perhaps all children, produce some stammering symptoms as they're learning to speak and as their language and speech production skills are developing in the vast majority of children, these symptoms don't develop into a persistent stammer. Moreover, even if they do, that doesn't automatically imply that that person will suffer from a persistent stammering disorder, by which I mean stammering or fear of stammering that significantly impedes that person's ability to communicate verbally and has a significant negative impact on their quality of life. Stammering frequently runs in families and the most significant risk factor for developing a stammer is having a family history of stammering. 
especially one or more first-degree relatives, that is, brothers, sisters or parents, who stammer. Moreover, the risk is higher for children who have relatives who still stammer and relatives whose stammering persisted over a long period of time. Studies that have investigated this issue have found that between 30 and 60 percent of people who stammer have one or more family members who stammer or stammered, whereas less than 10 percent of normally fluent speakers have a family member who stammers. I'll put a reference at the end of this slideshow to a review of these studies that was carried out in 2011 by Shelley Craft and Ehud Yeri. The second predisposing factor is age. Contrary to what many people think, children never stammer when they first start to speak. Usually the first symptoms of stammering start after they've begun to join words together to produce short phrases. And children are most likely to start producing symptoms of stammering when they're between two and four years of age. The clearest information on this comes from two large-scale studies that followed whole populations of young children for several years. The first study, carried out by Hans Manson on the island of Bornholm in Denmark, investigated 928 children born on the island in the years 1995 to 96. And Manson found that by three years of age, 18% of children showed some symptoms of stammering. In most of these children, the symptoms disappeared after a few weeks or months. And then, by nine years of age, 94% had recovered, leaving a prevalence of about 1.1%. The second study, carried out by Sheena Riley and her co-workers at the University of Victoria in Melbourne, Australia, followed 1,910 children from approximately nine months old onwards. They found that by four years of age, 11.8% of the children in their study had started to show symptoms of stammering. Again, after a few years, most of these children had fully recovered. Both of these two studies counted all stammering symptoms, even if they only lasted a few days, and consequently, many of the children who were identified as stammering never actually showed any signs of being disturbed by their stammering or even being aware of it. In contrast, most older studies only counted children whose stammering symptoms persisted for at least six months and had become a source of concern, at least for the parents, if not for the children as well. As one might expect, these older studies have tended to identify a smaller percentage of children as stammering. The most common finding of these older studies being that around 5% of two to four year old children have produced stammering symptoms that have persisted for at least six months. And that in about 80% of these children, the symptoms then spontaneously disappeared as they grew older. As a result, these studies found that around 1% of children continue to stammer into adulthood, which is more or less the same percentage as Manson had found in his study. It isn't clear why stammering symptoms are so common between two and four years of age. However, this is a time when children's language abilities are developing at a very fast rate, and during this period of fast development, they tend to make a lot of speech errors and tend to be relatively disfluent. Around two and a half years of age, children also begin to monitor and regulate their own speech to make it more socially appropriate. So they may tend to become more self-conscious of their speech errors and disfluencies at this age. Although it's most common for symptoms of stammering to appear in early childhood, the later they appear, the more likely they are to persist. And stammering that first appears after the age of three and a half is more likely to persist than stammering that appears before that age. Again, it's not clear why this is the case, although the onset of symptoms is generally much more traumatic and unsettling for older children than it is for young children. And the older one is when the symptoms begin, the more likely one is 
to react to them with fear and avoidance. As I'll discuss in subsequent slideshows, such reactions may increase the likelihood of its symptoms persisting. Perhaps not surprisingly, it's also been found that the longer a child's stammering goes on for, the more likely it is to persist. The third most important predisposing factor is gender. Around two and a half years of age, the prevalence of stammering is about equal in both boys and girls. However, as time goes on, girls are far more likely to recover than boys. By six years of age, stammering symptoms are about three times more likely to occur in boys than in girls. And then in adults, the male to female ratio increases still further and studies of adults who stammer have found it to be between four and six times more common in men. Currently it's not known why this is so. However, it's worth noting that boys generally tend to lag behind girls somewhat in their speech and language development, and their verbal communication abilities are generally less robust and more prone to dysfunction. Thus, preschool age boys are more susceptible to other developmental disorders as well, such as autism, speech delay, specific language impairment and phonological impairment. Boys are also more likely to suffer head injuries in girls, and as I'll discuss later, there's a subset of mainly boys who stammer, whose stammering began following head injuries. It is, however, possible that the male to female ratio is not as great as studies have suggested, because there are reasons to believe that more females who stammer may try to hide it than males. So it's possible that many cases of stammering in females go unreported. The next risk factor is the tendency to make speech errors. For over 10 years, a group of researchers headed by Anne Smith at Purdue University have been comparing the language and speech motor control abilities in young children who stammer and in age and gender matched controls. In 2015, Bridget Walsh and co-workers from this group published a paper entitled Speech Motor Planning and Execution Deficits in Early Childhood. In this paper, they, they described a key finding from their research, namely that boys who stammer tend to have less precise articulation and tend to make more speech errors than girls who stammer and normally fluent children. These differences were also present when they were not stammering. To clarify, here's a quote from their paper. We obtained data from over a hundred preschool children, including 58 children who stutter, allowing us to examine sex differences within each group. We found that boys who stutter produce speech with significantly reduced movement amplitudes and velocities and less coordinated articula articulatory movement patterns. Girls who stutter did not differ from their fluent peers on these speech motor measures. Thus, at age four to five years, boys but not girls who stutter are significantly lagging their normally fluent peers in speech motor maturation. They further added, it's important to note that the majority of girls in our stuttering group, unlike the boys, exhibited articulatory characteristics that were on a par with their non-stuttering peers. It seems reasonable to suggest that the earlier maturation of central speech motor control networks in girls who stutter compared to boys is a significant factor in the greater probability for girls to recover from stuttering. Although it wasn't possible for the researchers to confirm this, it's likely that some or all of these phonological and articulatory weaknesses were already present in the boys who stammer before they started stammering. In 2014, Purdue's Stuttering Project members Caroline Spencer and Christine Weber Fox published the findings from a separate study that had followed a group of 40 children who stammer over a four-year period in order to investigate which, if any, language and speech measures were associated with a lower chance of recovery. Their main finding 
was that stammering children with weaker consonant production abilities and weaker non-word repetition abilities were less likely to recover. The non-words used were made up of novel combinations of English sounds, such as rubid, comaline, and defermication. It's not known why these phonological and articulatory weaknesses are associated with poorer chances of recovery from stammering. However, it's noteworthy that children with these weaknesses often struggle to make themselves understood to listeners and may find verbal communication difficult. The finding that children who stammer are less proficient at copying novel combinations of sounds is particularly interesting in light of another recent finding, which I'll discuss later in this slideshow, of a brain abnormality in children who stammer, which may cause them to have difficulty associating the sounds they hear with the muscle movements required to reproduce those sounds. The abnormality is a deficiency of white matter in the tract connecting the auditory and motor parts of the brain. The next risk factor for stammering mentioned in the list is abnormal language abilities. For many years there has been a controversy regarding whether or not children who stammer have weaker language abilities. There are theoretical reasons to believe that they might have but researchers have not been able to back this up with consistent evidence. In 2012, Marilyn Nippold from the University of Oregon published a review that she had conducted in which she had assessed all the peer-reviewed published papers that had investigated whether or not there were any differences in the language abilities of children who stammer and children who don't stammer. Although a number of these papers claim to have found evidence that children who stammer have weaker language abilities, on closer examination all of these claims prove to be unreliable. In contrast, the most reliable studies either found no differences at all or they found that children who stutter have slightly more advanced language abilities, as was found by the large-scale study carried out by Sheena Riley in Australia that I mentioned in the previous slide. Specifically, the Riley study found that at four years of age, children who stutter, quote, on average displayed better receptive and expressive language and nonverbal intelligence at outcome than their non-stuttering counterparts. Interestingly, the Riley study also found that the mothers of children who stammer had a significantly higher level of education than the mothers of children who don't stammer. Perhaps this might partially explain why the children who stammer have more advanced language skills. In this regard, a number of researchers have proposed that children with precocious language abilities might be at risk of stammering because the more complex utterances they produce tend to require a higher level of speech motor control to execute them. And perhaps such children's speech motor control abilities are not yet sufficiently developed to enable them to express that complex level of language. As I mentioned previously, studies have repeatedly shown that one of the biggest risk factors or predisposing factors for stammering is having other family members who stammer. However, this doesn't necessarily imply that stammering is passed on genetically because people who live in the same family tend to be subjected to similar experiences and environmental conditions and often tend to share similar values and beliefs. As it happens, researchers have been able to calculate the size of the role that genetics actually plays in stammering by investigating families who have twins and by investigating how frequently, if one of the twins has a stammer, the other twin also stammers. The technical term for this is the concordance rate, and it's particularly useful to compare the concordance rates for stammering in identical compared to in non-identical twins. The concordance rate refers to the frequency with which a particular condition occurs in both twins as opposed to just in one of the two. So for example a concordance rate of 100% percent 
means that if one of the twins has that condition, then in 100% of cases, the other twin will have it as well. The reason that concordance rate statistics are so revealing is because identical twins both have exactly the same genes, whereas in non-identical twins, only 50% of their genes are the same. So if a condition is entirely inherited, then the concordance rate for that condition in identical twins would be 100%, whereas in non-identical twins, in other words, in fraternal twins, it would be substantially less than 100%. If, on the other hand, that condition is caused entirely by environmental factors, in other words, by what happens to you in your life, and genes didn't play any role at all, then the concordance rates for that condition in identical and non-identical twins would be very similar, and in both cases it would be less than 100%. In fact, the actual concordance rates for stammering in identical twins is around 50%, whereas in non-identical twins it's only around 15%. The difference between these two percentages clearly implies that genes play a major role in determining whether or not someone stammers. However, the fact that the concordance rate in identical twins is less than 100% means that environmental factors do nevertheless also play an important role in causing stammering. The most widely accepted interpretation of these statistics is that what's actually inherited genetically is a predisposition towards stammering. Then, whether or not that predisposition subsequently leads to actual stammering depends on what happens to that person in their daily life. I should add that although it's widely believed that genes do play a major role in predisposing people to stammering, so far, researchers have only been able to identify genes that are likely to be associated with stammering in about 5% of the stammers they've studied. So this area of research still has a long way to go. It would be really nice if research could provide us with some clues as to what exactly it is that's inherited that predisposes to stammering. However, so far such research has not come up with any reliable findings. Bearing in mind that genetic studies have found more than one gene abnormality that's associated with stammering, it seems likely that genes may cause a number of physical and psychological differences that predispose to stammering. Whatever those differences may finally turn out to be, the fact that they're successfully passed on from generation to generation suggests that, in addition to predisposing to stammering, they probably also result in some strengths, and therefore also evolutionary advantages. So, for example, they're more likely to account for the high linguistic capacities that many children who stammer are blessed with, and less likely to account for their relatively weak speech production capacities. In 2007, the Swedish researcher Per Alm published the findings of his research into the potential role that neurological damage stemming from head injuries and infectious diseases may play in the onset of stammering. For the research, he questioned and tested two groups of adults who stammer, one which had a family history of stammering and one which did not. Among other things, his research revealed that 78% of the group of stammerers who had no family history of stammering reported that they'd suffered head injuries or infectious diseases shortly before their stammering first began. In contrast, only 43% of the stammering participants with a family history of stammering reported having suffered such events. Alm interpreted these findings as suggesting that neurological damage from head injuries and, infections and infectious diseases may constitute a key contributory factor towards the onset of stammering in stammerers who do not have a genetic predisposition to stammering. Interestingly, Alm also found that the group whose stammering started after head injuries or infectious diseases often also experienced symptoms of ADHD, including hyperactivity, 
and difficulty maintaining attention to tasks. And as a group, they also tended to be slightly more anxious. In contrast, ADHD symptoms were much less frequent in the group of stammerers with a family history of stammering. It's noteworthy that ADHD is a condition stemming from an underproduction of dopamine. And Alm noted that it was possible that the types of neurological damage that predispose to stammering may be those that result in the reduction of the brain's capacity to produce enough dopamine. Alm's research suggested that people who stammer can be divided into two groups. Those whose stammering is largely the result of a genetic predisposition and those whose stammering is largely the result of brain damage. And his research has clarified that each of these groups has somewhat different characteristic symptoms. For example, stammering resulting from a genetic predisposition is likely to begin at an early age and to affect boys and girls equally. Such individuals are likely to have an above average intelligence and be socially well adjusted. Although Elm didn't mention this in his research, it would seem likely also that such children may tend to be born into high performing families and consequently may tend to be subjected to relatively high linguistic demands. In contrast, the stammerers without a genetic predisposition are more likely to have experienced some sort of brain injury prior to the onset of their stammering. They're more likely to be boys, and the onset of such stammering is likely to be somewhat later than the genetic type. Such children may often show symptoms of ADHD, such as high levels of distractibility and reactivity, and sometimes hyperactivity. In terms of the capacities and demands model, one might expect that stammerers without a genetic predisposition to stammering, especially those who have suffered brain damage of some sort, may tend to exhibit more traits associated with diminished capacities rather than traits associated with high demands. If these two subtypes of stammering really do exist, and there is now a lot of accumulated evidence to suggest that they do, then it follows that there must be a third group of people who stammer who have both a genetic predisposition as well as brain damage. Presumably such children would show symptoms characteristic of both subtypes and in line with this may be subject to both high demands and to reduced capacities. In the next few slides I want to discuss some of the environmental influences that research suggests are highly likely to predispose to stammering. These are brain damage or degeneration, unhelpful learning, unhelpful beliefs and traumatic experiences. I want to start by discussing stammering that starts following brain damage or brain degeneration. In adults this sort of stammering is often called neurogenic stammering. The best known examples of this are following strokes in which parts of the brain responsible for speech or language production are damaged. Importantly however Following a stroke, stammering doesn't always start straight away. It usually develops some weeks or months later. And before it develops, the stroke patient's speech or language is often impaired in other ways. Commonly following a stroke, the first symptoms to emerge include word finding difficulties, sentence formulation difficulties, an increase in speech errors, and stiffness and difficulty moving speech muscles. The symptoms can be quite different in different individuals, probably reflecting the fact that different parts of the brain have been damaged. Then, a few weeks later, they start to produce symptoms of stammering. It often appears as though the stroke patient's stammering starts as a result of their unsuccessful attempts to rectify the language or speech symptoms that have arisen as a direct result of their stroke. Or, as I'll discuss in the next slideshow, it may result from their loss of confidence in their ability to speak well enough to be understood and their consequent tendency to anticipate communication failure. Stammering also sometimes starts in people suffering from Parkinson's disease, 
a chronic degenerative disorder resulting from the degeneration of a part of the brain responsible for producing dopamine. Again, the same pattern seems to arise, whereby before they start to stammer, the Parkinson's patient's speech is affected in other ways. Most often his speech becomes weak and his speech muscle movements become smaller and his speech rate becomes irregular. The net result is speech that's quiet and poorly articulated and often difficult for listeners to understand. The stammering then sometimes seems to start when the patient tries to make extra effort to compensate for these changes. Of course, strokes and Parkinson's disease are conditions that generally affect older people. In contrast, head injuries, infections and fevers, all of which can result in brain damage, can occur at any age. And it's possible that a significant proportion of stammering that occurs in young children may start following these events in much the same way as it does in stroke patients whose brains have been damaged by the stroke. It's noteworthy that head injuries are particularly common in young children, especially young boys, and this may partially account for why stammering is seen more often in boys than in girls. The research findings published by Alman Reisberg in 2007 strongly suggested that stammering in young children does indeed frequently arise following neurological damage following head injuries and infectious diseases. This raises a question, what sort of brain damage may predispose to stammering in young children? In trying to answer this question, over the past few years, researchers performed imaging studies in which they've scanned the brains of young children who stammer and compared them to the brains of normally fluent children. In 2015, one such brain imaging study carried out by Su Yung Chang and her co-workers at the University of Michigan has provided some insights into the brain abnormalities present in young children who stammer. The study compared the brain structures of 37 young children who stammer with those of normally fluent controls between 3 and 10 years of age. And they found that certain regions of the brains of the children who stammer contain significantly less white matter than those same regions of the controls. Moreover, they also found that the children with the most severe stammers had the greatest deficits in white matter. Because these differences were found in children very close to the onset of their stammering, they were almost certainly present before the stammering began. In order to understand the significance of these findings, it's important to know a bit about the role of white matter in the brain. White matter is composed of fatty tissue called myelin, which fulfills a similar role to the plastic coating around electric wires. It insulates the nerve cells so that they can conduct nerve impulses quickly and efficiently with a minimum of leakage or short circuiting. If there's not enough white matter, the conduction of nerve impulses between different brain areas will be impeded and as a result signals may take longer or may fail to reach the places that they need to reach. Young children are always relatively deficient in white matter compared to older children and adults and the amount of white matter surrounding nerve cells continues to increase right up until children reach their teens. So the deficiency in white matter found in the brains of children who stammer, compared to normally fluent children, may actually constitute a developmental delay in white matter growth, which may sometimes resolve as those children grow older. It's not clear whether the deficiency in white matter that Chang and co-workers found in children who stammer was the result of a genetic difference or the result of prior infections or injuries or a mixture of the two. Interestingly, there are certain degenerative diseases that result in a decrease in myelination of nerve cells, the best known being multiple sclerosis, and there have been some cases of adult onset stammering occurring as a complication of multiple sclerosis. The nerve tracts that were found to be most deficient in white matter in the children who stammer 
included some that are especially important for the fine-tuning of speech. These include the tracks that link the auditory cortex with the motor cortex, which, amongst other things, play a key role in enabling speakers to use their auditory feedback to monitor how their speech sounds. This finding is particularly relevant because functional brain imaging studies have found evidence that suggests that stammerers tend to monitor their auditory feedback excessively. And it's been known for many years that stammering severity in people who stammer can be substantially reduced by interventions such as auditory masking that prevent them from such monitoring. In addition, the nerve tracts in the corpus callosum that joins the left and right halves of the brain were also found to be deficient in white matter. These nerve tracts support many roles and functions, and like the tracts that join the auditory and motor cortices, they too play an important role in enabling speakers to adjust their speech to take into account the needs of the speaking situation. In other words, they support our pragmatic communication abilities. Damage to the corpus callosum is quite common following brain injuries and often results in an increased tendency for speakers to say things that are inappropriate to the speaking situation. In other words, to make appropriateness errors. There have also been some published reports of adult onset stammering beginning following demyelination of the corpus callosum following brain injuries and chronic degenerative diseases including multiple sclerosis. Conversely, more recent findings of a longitudinal study by Chow and Chang, published in 2017, revealed that deficiency in the white matter in these tracts of children who stammer sometimes resolves as the children grow older, and when this happens, their stammering decreases or even disappears. One of the findings of Per Alm's research was that compared to stammerers with a family history of stammering, those who have no family history of stammering more frequently reported that prior to their stammering onset, they'd been hospitalized due to an infectious disease or a closed head injury. Also, a larger proportion of stammerers with no family history reported that there had been complications surrounding their birth. To account for these findings, Alm proposed in a paper published in 2004 that all of these events may have resulted in damage to a part of the brain called the substantia nigra in the basal ganglia, which is responsible for the production of dopamine. He also proposed that this damage may account for why the onset of stammering following such events is often accompanied by symptoms of ADHD which is known to stem from an underproduction of dopamine. Dopamine is a neurotransmitter that fulfills many functions in the body, including the regulation of how easily muscle movements, including speech muscle movements, can be initiated. Sometimes dopamine has been described as fulfilling a role similar to that of oil in a car engine, in as much as it keeps everything flowing smoothly when a person doesn't have enough dopamine, his movements become irregular and difficult to initiate, and his muscles become stiff. Dopamine also plays another role of enabling us to regulate where our attention goes. And when trying to perform actions, people with deficient dopamine are likely to find themselves experience difficulty staying on task due to being excessively distracted by thoughts and events and physical sensations. In contrast, in people with enough dopamine, all these distracting stimuli are suppressed by their dopamine, leaving them free to focus on whatever task they're trying to achieve. Although there's not yet any firm evidence to support this dopamine hypothesis of stammering, it does fit well with many of the observations that have been made in relation to stammering that occurs in the absence of any family history of stammering. It also fits well with the observation that stammering sometimes returns in old age following the onset of Parkinson's disease, which is caused by degeneration of the substantia nigra and related loss of the ability to produce dopamine. Alm also hypothesized 
that in some people who stammer, in particular those with a family history of stammering, stammering may be related to an abnormally high production of dopamine. And there is indeed some evidence from pharmacological and brain imaging studies to support this. So it seems that stammering may be related to either too little or too too much dopamine, depending on whether its origin is environmental or genetic. In recent years, thanks largely to some influential publications by trauma specialists Peter Levine and Bessel van der Kolk, there's been a general increase in public interest in the role that traumatic experiences play in predisposing people to a number of psychological disorders. This has prompted a corresponding increase in interest in the possible role that trauma and traumatic experiences may play in the onset of stammering. In contrast, since the 1980s, mainstream stammering researchers have tended to reject the theory that stammering in children can come about as a result of psychological trauma, and have often argued that there's no reliable evidence to support it. In adults, although it's generally accepted that stammering can come about as a result of brain damage, again, the possibility that it might have a purely psychological origin has been generally disregarded. Certainly, cases of so-called psychogenic stammering have been reported from time to time. However, psychogenic stammering has generally been considered to constitute a completely different disorder, unrelated to neurogenic and developmental stammering. However, in 2010, a review article by Christine Lundgren and co-workers compared the findings of a number of published studies of neurogenic and psychogenic stammering and concluded that these two types of stammering are far more similar in nature than prior publications suggest, and it's often not possible to distinguish between them on the basis of observable symptoms. More recently, in 2018, a review by Rocchio Norman co-workers of acquired stammering in veterans of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan has suggested that the onset of stammering following psychological trauma is in fact a common occurrence in war situations where psychological trauma is highly likely to occur. And specifically, in the review they state, and I quote, of the 235 veterans with an acquired stammering diagnosis, 5.6% of them had traumatic brain injury only as a diagnosis. 30.6% had post-traumatic stress disorder only as a diagnosis and 43.4% had both post-traumatic stress disorder and traumatic brain injury as a diagnosis. These findings from the Norman et al. review strongly suggest that in adults, the onset of stammering can indeed occur as a result of purely psychological trauma. And if this is the case for adults, then it seems probable that it must also be the case for children. In addition to reports of stammering arising in soldiers as a complication of PTSD, the case histories, biographies and personal accounts of ordinary civilians who stammer frequently tell the story of how their stammering began suddenly following a traumatic experience. The most common such scenario being at school when they were required to stand up and speak in front of their class. Many of these individuals are still able, years later, to vividly describe their experiences of the first time that they got stuck. And many of them would insist that prior to that traumatic experience, they'd not been in any way afraid of stammering and did not stammer. Of course, it's always possible that they did stammer prior to their experience, but were simply not aware of it. But whatever the case, it seems that prior to their traumatic experience, they did not have a stammering problem, inasmuch as their daily life was not blighted by the fear of stammering. For researchers to confirm beyond any doubt that such traumatic speaking experiences caused a stammering problem, they would have to have fully investigated the child's speech before the traumatic event occurred, in order to be sure that his stammering, or his stammering problem, started at that point. 
However, because it's impossible to know in advance which children will have such experiences, such reliable corroborative evidence has never been produced. Nevertheless, on the basis of what individual stammerers say, it's highly likely that such traumatic speaking experiences can play a major role in the onset of stammering in some school-age children. Statistically speaking, children who experience such late onset stammering are less likely to recover compared to children whose stammering started before they were old enough to go to school. In the 1970s, Oliver Bloodstein at the University of Iowa developed what came to be known as the anticipatory struggle hypothesis of stammering. Essentially, Bloodstein proposed that many different factors, genetic, physiological and environmental, may cause a child to repeatedly experience communication failure and give a child the impression that verbal communication is difficult and that he has to try very hard to make himself understood to his listeners. Bloodstein suggested that children start to stammer because having experienced many experiences of communication failure and having arrived at this conclusion that speaking is difficult, they start to put too much effort into speaking. And in particular, they develop the habit of tensing their muscles and focusing on trying to say just one word at a time. Unfortunately, rather than improving their chances of successful communication, these strategies just make them more disfluent and so they fall into a vicious circle where their excessive efforts to make themselves understood result in speech that is less clear and less fluent, which then reinforces their tendency to make excessive effort while speaking. Although available evidence doesn't support Bloodstein's proposal that stammerers' strategies of tension and fragmentation cause stammering, it remains quite possible that repeated experiences of communication failure may well cause a child, or indeed an adult, to conclude that speaking is difficult, and this belief may in turn cause him to react to speaking situations in ways that have the unintended consequence of impairing his ability to initiate the timely execution of his planned speech. I'll talk more about this hypothesis and its ramifications in the next slideshow. As I mentioned earlier, it's possible to be subject to several predisposing factors and yet never to develop a stammer. Nevertheless, the more predisposing factors one is subjected to, the greater the likelihood that sooner or later stammering symptoms will occur and a stammering problem will develop. And just as there are many factors that predispose to stammering, there are also many factors that can potentially trigger moments of stammering. Indeed, there are an almost infinite number of possible triggers, including particular sounds, particular words, particular topics, speaking situations, listeners, and so on. However, if one looks at what lies behind these triggers, more often than not, they tend to be associated with one or more of the following. The anticipation of communication failure, the perception of a need to speak more clearly and accurately in order to be heard or, uh, or understood, the fear of eliciting negative responses from the people one's trying to talk to, and sometimes the fear that one's communication attempt may result in social rejection. Most of these triggers arise in a speaker because the speaking situation reminds him of similar situations in which his speech did indeed result in communication failure or misunderstandings. Different people are susceptible to, to different triggers, but whatever the trigger, the effect is similar. It results in difficulty initiating or moving forward with the motor execution of whatever it is that one wants to say. So just to recap, we know that some people have a strong predisposition to stammering 
and that some of this predisposition may be inherited and some of it may come about as a result of the things that happen in people's lives. Because this is a difficult area to research, we cannot be 100% sure what the predisposing factors in a person are. Nevertheless, available evidence from brain imaging studies suggests that insufficient white matter in certain regions of the brain can predispose people to stammering, as can an under or overproduction of dopamine. Similarly, available evidence from behavioural studies and accounts from individuals who stammer suggest that traumatic experiences and speech-related unhelpful beliefs can also predispose people to stammering. Then, in people who are predisposed to stammering, actual moments of stammering may be triggered by a wide variety of stimuli, including fear of one's speech eliciting negative responses, anticipation that one's speech will result in communication failure, the perception of a need to speak more accurately, and fear that one's speech performance may lead to social rejection. So if we put all of these observations together, we can start to see a common pattern. First of all, a combination of predisposing factors limit the person's ability to speak as clearly and accurately as they think the speaking situation requires. Then, Memories of past experiences of having failed to communicate or of having elicited negative responses in similar speaking situations lead that person to anticipate that his current communication attempt will result in failure or will elicit more negative responses. Then, in response to this anticipation, he tries as hard as he can to speak more clearly and accurately in order to increase his chances of success. Unfortunately, however, the harder he tries to speak clearly and accurately, the more disfluent he becomes and the more likely he is to stammer. And because stammering diminishes the clarity of his speech, as he tries harder, his chances of success go down rather than up. And as a result, he finds himself trapped in a vicious circle whereby the anticipation of communication failure causes him to stammer and the stammering causes him to anticipate further communication failure. Ironically, many of the underlying impairments that predispose to stammering tend to become less severe as people grow older. So for example, the white matter surrounding cell axons continues to develop and deficiency of white matter in young children often disappears by the time they reach their teens. Similarly, thanks to brain plasticity, brains can often recover much of the functioning that they've lost due to brain injuries or strokes. So it's quite possible that in many older children and adults who stammer, the underlying impairments that initially predisposed them to stammering may actually have largely res resolved. So once a vicious circle is established and the child who stammers has developed the habit of trying harder to speak clearly and accurately whenever he anticipates communication failure, his stammering is likely to, to continue to occur, even if the underlying impairments that originally predisposed him to it have diminished or disappeared. This hypothesis that stammering may persist after the initial predisposing factors have disappeared has, has been named the gone but not forgotten hypothesis.